Okay, you can turn in your Bible this morning to Proverbs chapter 31. Now, we already have a Proverbs 31 message, but it's in the opposite direction. It's the one that you're typically going to hear, and that is the Proverbs 31 woman. Now, a lot of people will go through this and they'll use it to kind of, you know, here, women, this is your standards, this is all that you have to get done, and, you know, it's a, a lot of times it's actually used to put women down. Sometimes with some of the brethren, they're a little bit, you know, really strict. Uh, it can be used for that, I should say. Not a lot of times, but it can be used for that. But you see, what you actually have to understand is, for the Proverbs 31 woman to exist, there also has to be a Proverbs 31 man. And we're going to look at that today. We're actually going to look at the Proverbs 31 man and see some interesting things here. Now look at verse 10. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10 is where we're going to start. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Now who would the who be there? Would it be a woman or a man? It would be a man. Okay? It's very interesting there. And it's interesting because a good man will spend some time looking for a good woman. A good man is not one that goes out and marries the very first woman that he finds. A good man will pray and ask for the Lord, or ask for the Lord to provide him with a wife, and will wait on the Lord. He'll be patient. A good man just doesn't say, "I'm just going to go out and oh, we like the same kind of music, and we saw a movie, and it was both liked it and stuff." So I'm going to marry her. No, a good man will wait and find a virtuous woman. Why? Because he he realizes that her price is far above rubies. He realizes that she's a, a very valuable um, thing to have. Now look at verse 11. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. And of course that's very true, by the way, of the analogy there of a good Christian being the bride of Jesus Christ. A good Christian doesn't need to be spoiled by Jesus Christ. Okay, A good Christian is not one that says, Oh, Jesus, I need lots of money and lots of lands and a big house and a nice fancy car and whatever else. The bride of Christ should be content with two things, the Bible says back in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and that's food and raiment. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Okay, that's a good bride of Jesus Christ. But it also applies here to a woman. But notice here it says, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. Now how does that work? <clears throat> well, a good man will trust his wife and dictate responsibilities to her and praise her when she does a good job. Okay? That's how he's able to trust her. I, you know, I... <clears throat> excuse me. I had this kind of revealed to me yesterday. We were outside building a, you know, woodshed area that we can store our firewood. And I had my wife, you know, down in the yard working on cleaning up the old roof metal that we were using. And I showed her how to use the power washer, you know, to, to clean it off. And I was kind of looking over a couple times going, you know, she's kind of working a little bit slow, you know. <clears throat> you know, she's too meticulous. And I was coming up with all this criticism in my mind. And I thought, just keep your mouth shut. Let her do it her way. And a couple times I looked back and I thought, well, she's getting a little bit faster. Uh, yeah. And after a while, I totally didn't even think about it. And I was up there on the roof and, and all of a sudden I looked over and, oh, she's done with that piece. Why? Well, you get to a point where you, you're able to trust your wife, you just say, well, she doesn't do it my way, but she does it her way. And she gets the job done and she does it well. So my heart can safely trust in her. I don't have to be there watching over her. And, and you know, one of the quickest ways to, to make problems in your marriage, and, I, you know, I've, I've been married for a while now, almost two months. So I'm, I'm qualified to talk about this. <laughs> I'm finding out stuff, okay? But one of the quickest ways to make problems in your marriage is to be overly critical of your wife. To be looking over her shoulder. I mean, nobody likes that. But especially so with a wife. She doesn't like her husband to be going, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it. Why, why do you do it that way? What were you thinking? You know, bad idea. So look at the reverse there, verse 11. If your heart safely trusts in your wife, what does that mean? That means you let her do it her way as long as she gets the job done. You can safely trust in her, and you don't need to spoil her. Okay? 
And the truth of the matter is, part of that is another part of this whole thing. Keep your hand there in Proverbs chapter 31. But now go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. This is another well-known portion of Scripture in terms of a man's responsibility to his wife. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. <clears throat> part of the requirements for a Proverbs 31 woman is that her husband provides for her. And you say, was well, that a New Testament thing? Yes, it is. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, notice the his there, it's talking about the man, not the woman. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That's what God thinks about a man that does not provide for his wife and children. Okay, and it's talking there too about a widow, you know, in, uh, in verses, um, uh, where are we at? Verses 3 through 7. Okay, you see the thing of the care of widows there. But <clears throat> verse 8 specifically shows the responsibilities that a man has towards his wife and children. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 30. We're going to look at that. We're going to see a couple more responsibilities that the husband has to provide for his wife. If a husband isn't doing his part, you're never going to have a Proverbs 31 woman. And that's the point of this sermon. There has to be a Proverbs 31 man for there to be a woman that meets those verses. Look at verse 25 here. It says, Husbands, love your wives even, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Did you know a good man will love his wife in a sacrificial way? See there and it says, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know one thing I realized when I got married? It's a sacrifice. I have to give up my single life. I can't do what I want when I want anymore. And you better think about that, by the way, if you're looking to get married. You're going to have to give up what you want in life. Because now you have a wife that you need to take care of. You need to provide for, but you also have to give love to her. Okay? And I'm going to tell you right now, and this is something I'm learning, sometimes women need to talk. And there are times as a man, you don't want to listen. But you know what? If you love your wife, you'll listen. You'll sit there and you will sacrifice your time and you will listen. You know? And, and not just, you know, sitting there going, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. And she's like asking you questions or something. You're going, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> you know? You actually have to listen. See, that's the way you make a Proverbs 31 woman. Is by actually being interested in what she wants. And what she needs to talk to you about. There has to be communication in a marriage or it doesn't work. And if you want a Proverbs 31 woman and you're a man... You're going to have to sacrifice your time to listen to your wife. That's what you're going to have to do. Look at verse uh, 26 here. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now notice there in verses 26 through 28, it's speaking spiritually of the church, but also of the wife. Now let me ask you a question if you're a man. Do you cleanse your wife with the washing of water by the word? Or are you making her life dirty through things like dirty jokes? Or how about bringing filth into the home via TV or movies or internet? Are you dirtying your wife or are you cleansing her? Do you read the Bible to your wife or discuss Scripture with her? The Bible says you're supposed to do it right there in verse 26. Sanctifying and cleansing your wife by the washing of water by the Word. That's very important. Uh, first, keep your hand there in Ephesians. Making you keep your hand in all kinds of places today. And turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Some men will say, well, you know, I don't, I don't teach my wife the Bible. That's my pastor's job. That's the job of the preacher. Really? 
Well, we're going to see about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35. You have great responsibility to your wife if you get married. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 says here, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their pastors at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Is that what it says? You need to follow along in your Bible to make sure that you are not being deceived. It does not say pastors. It says let them ask their husbands at home. A husband needs to be able to know the Bible enough that he can teach his wife. I didn't say you have to be seminary trained and a PhD and a THD and THM and all the other stuff. I didn't say that. But you need to know the basics. And you need to sanctify and cleanse your wife with the washing of water by the word. It's not your pastor's job. And how many Christian men out there hide behind their pastor? Well, you know, the wife comes and she says, Well, honey, what about this thing here or that? Or, Oh, we'll have to go talk to the preacher. What's wrong with you? Can't you study the Word on your own? Can't you understand the Word? Can't you look this stuff up on your own? See? See, that's, you know, I get kind of rough on, on the, the, the whole church building structure, but that's one of the reasons why. Because church is separated from normal, everyday life. Church is a building that you go to with the pastor at it, and he has all the answers to your problems. It's not supposed to be that way. You are the church, and you are supposed to be, quote, in church 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And each man is supposed to be able to know enough scripture that he can teach and train. Alright? Now, you know, yeah, God calls certain men to be pastors to oversee the flock. I understand that. I understand that the church has to come together and meet to be able to instruct in the word and admonish and everything else. I understand that. But a lot of people, a lot of Christians, hide behind their pastors. They won't witness to people because, well, I'll, I'll have my pastor talk to them. They won't find answers in the Bible because, well, I'll have to ask my pastor. You're supposed to have a relationship with Jesus Christ for salvation, but also for sanctification. The Bible says that there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, not the man, the pastor. The pastor is not the mediator between you and the Lord. You're supposed to deal with God directly through Jesus Christ. It's very important to remember that. Um, turn back to Ephesians there. Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, it says here in verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And of course, you have the thing of a spiritual application there, yes, but also a physical application in that when two get married, a man and a woman, they become one flesh. And by the way, people say, oh, I think sodomite marriage is okay. How do you work that out? Christ and the church is given there as a man and a woman, not a man and a man. Isn't that interesting? You can't put sodomite marriage into the Bible and make it fit. It doesn't work. Okay, And a lot of these churches are going to be forced, these 501c3 churches are going to be forced to start defending sodomite marriages and performing sodomite marriages. Why? Because they're creatures of the state. And the state's going to tell them, this is what you're going to do, or we're going to remove your status, we're going to come and shut down your building, because they own it. And that's what you're going to see. There's already stories coming out all the time on the Internet. Church is complaining because they're being forced to, they're, they're being told you're going to have to perform sodomite marriages. And they're trying to claim First Amendment rights and all this stuff. You gave up your First Amendment rights when you became 501c3. And this is going to be one of the big dividing lines, the issue of sodomite marriage. And if you're part of an incorporated church, you're going to have to, in the future, you're going to be leaving it. I'll tell you that right now. Now, let me just say this, if you are a man and you are keeping Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 through 30, you're doing those things, you're on your way to having a Proverbs 31 woman. See, because you're doing your part as a Christian man. And therefore, your wife is going to be more likely to be 
like the Proverbs 31 woman, because she's going to be encouraged to it, to be like that. Now turn back to Proverbs chapter 31, verse 12. And we just saw there in 1 Timothy 5, 8 especially, that a man is to provide for his own, and here's the result of it. Uh, verse 12 in Proverbs 31. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. You know, when a woman feels encouraged and she is, and her husband trusts her, she will work willingly. He will not have to boss her around and say, why didn't you get this done or why didn't you get that done? Encourage your wife and she will do good for you. That's very important. A lot of men don't do that. A lot of men just kind of like, oh, I expect you. You're supposed to be a Proverbs 31 woman. Now get to it, woman. Let it going to work. Okay, you have to encourage her. You have to be there to nourish and cherish her. And it's interesting too because as we just read there in 1 Corinthians 14, a good man is also going to be a good teacher to his wife. He'll teach her the Word of God. And also, I think a man needs to take an interest in the things that his wife is working on. Learn with her things like cooking, canning, um, you know, well, I'm going to get into this a little bit later, but the women of our church here are learning to sew. You know, there's a lot of things. And a man needs to encourage his wife in those areas. And don't expect to have a Proverbs 31 woman if you're not going to encourage her. You know, I mean, nobody likes that. Now, I mean, would you like to have an employer that just comes over and puts down your work all the time? Would you want to work for somebody like that? Of course not. You're not going to want to work willingly for a boss that's always putting you down. Well, how is it different with marriage? It's even more important in marriage to have that relationship between husband and wife where the husband encourages his wife. Uh, Proverbs 31, verse 14. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. Now that can be interpreted two ways. Number one, it could mean that she's going and getting kind of exotic foods because she's, you know, you know, she brings her food from afar so she can make special things and uh, she's really talented at cooking, or it could also mean that she's actually going out looking for bargains. And those are the best places to get the best prices. And again, a husband needs to encourage his wife in that area. When she comes and she goes, look, I saved a dollar on this item or something. Encourage her. That's important. Um, Proverbs 31, verse 15. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. Again, you see a very important thing here. And that is that a good man will provide his wife with raw materials. Notice that. You know, you see the whole thing there uh, in those verses. And we're going to see more as we continue. But he gives her the raw materials which she needs to be able to provide for the home. Okay, she's able to work with her hands to take these things, foods and ingredients and stuff like that, and cloth and, and all the things that, that you know women, a good woman should learn how to do. She can take those and make good things with them. You know, there's an old saying, we're going to look at this real quick too, and that is that uh, an idle mind is the devil's playground. You know, one of the worst things a man can do to his wife is to make her idle. Do everything for her. Make her life too easy. And we're going to you say, well, what are you talking about? Well, turn back to Proverbs chapter 6. People say, you mean I should make my wife work hard? Well, let's not make your wife work hard. You should make, you should provide for her things that she will want to work hard. Okay. And we're going to see about this, the thing of, of what happens when life becomes too easy. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. So an ant here is compared to a, a female. Very interesting. Which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Hmm. If you give a, a woman a, a garden and things and she's able to have that and, and know and everything else, 
a lot of times they'll go out and they'll be busy in the garden and getting things ready. Once they learn how to can and how to do all the other stuff and preserve food, that's good. It's good for a woman. But you say, well, I don't know. doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Well, look at verse 9. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep? So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. Hmm. Did you know that when this country collapses, and it's going to happen, it's not a question of if, but when, we have to have the mark of the beast system come in, the cashless society. We have a cash society right now, so that has to be crashed. Okay? It's just the way it's going to be. And we can't keep going on. We're 20 plus trillion dollars in debt. We aren't just going to keep going on merrily on our way. You know, in America is somehow going to get out of the what's coming to the surf. Things are going to crash. And you know who's going to suffer the most? Those men and women that don't know how to do anything for themselves. That live a life of convenience. They don't know how to grow food. They don't know how to get gather food. They don't know how to prepare food, store it up. Those are the people that are going to suffer the most. Okay? The, their poverty is going to come as one that travaileth. Or uh, traveleth, actually, would be the, the right way to say that. But the whole point is, <clears throat> things are going to get rough, and if you don't know how to survive, it's going to be a problem. Proverbs chapter 24. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 24, verse 30. The Bible has a lot to say about slothfulness. That's one of the sins that's mentioned in the Bible many times. Proverbs 24, verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. That's a good thing to do right there. You see a place that's all run down and fallen down and the people are in, you can see the blue glow coming through the window and they're all sitting in there watching TV. You can actually look at that and learn instruction from that. Uh, verse 33, Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that, that uh, traveleth and thy want as an armed man. So repeating again Proverbs chapter 6. So the Bible teaches that a good woman, and here in this verse, these passages, a good man, they will take care of things around their home. Okay? Staying busy, staying active is good for you. It's very important to do that. Now, turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 5, and we're going to see again here in the New Testament the same basic thing repeated. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11 says, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Again, the idle mind is the devil's playground. A woman who is idle, who just everything's provided for, or a man just takes care of everything and, and she never has any work to do or anything like that, it's going to end up in, in trouble. And a lot of women, too, become not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies. They start going around, they start gossiping, they start their little circles and stuff. You know, there's a thing here locally, these women wear these red hats, you know, red hat group, I don't know what they call themselves, but you'll see them, you'll see them going to the restaurants and stuff and they just, they're now don't tell me that they're not gossiping. You better believe that they're sitting around gossiping. What are they doing? They should be at home, being busy around the house. 
But instead, they go out and they go to restaurants and they go all over the place and just sit there and da 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 I'm not saying women shouldn't talk to one another. Of course not. You know, it's good to have Christian women fellowshipping with one another. But stay active. It's a bad thing for women to just become idle. Okay? Uh, verse Proverbs chapter 31, verse 19. We'll go back there again. You say, well, so what then should a Proverbs 31 man do? Well, keep your wife busy and encouraged. Keep her doing things and stuff and encourage her when she's doing right. Say, hey, that was really good. I, I really like that new recipe you tried or whatever. You know, if it's a bad recipe that she tried, well, still encourage her. Well, I think there was a little bit much salt in that one, you know. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't make that one again, you know. that. But it was good. I'm glad, you know, you tried something new. Don't be like, it was the most horrible thing and I'll spit it out or something. No, don't do that. You say, why? Well, because then you won't get a Proverbs 31 woman. Because you're not being a Proverbs 31 man. Proverbs 31, verse 19. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. Now, we don't have that very often anymore. You don't see women taking wool and turning it into yarn or whatever and then weaving things with it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's kind of a skill that's been lost. Uh, I guess you could still learn it, you know. But, uh, I mean, I'm not totally against modern convenience of actually going to the store and buying your own thread or your own pre-made, you know, wool yarns and things like that. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to, like, we're going to go back and get, you know, sheep and we're going to shear them and get it into wool and do the spindle and the distaff and all that, you know, and, and get the little bobbin. And, I mean, I don't even know all the terms. But, you know, you don't have to get that and have a big loom and stuff to weave things. It may be neat, but, you know, use modern conveniences. Go to the store, get yarn, get thread, whatever, and make things. That's what the Bible's talking about there. Why? She's busy. She's active. Stays active in, in what she's doing. And again, like I said, I'm, I'm glad here that the women in this church, you know, are all either know how to use a sewing machine or are learning to use a sewing machine. That's a, that's a good skill to have. And if you're a woman out there and you don't know how to sew anything, that's something you ought to put some time into. You ought to do some study on that. You know, you say, well, am I going to have time to do that when I'm watching my soap operas? Um, but you ought to shut those soap operas off because they're garbage. And you ought to do something with your hands. You know? Something to think about there. Uh, verse 20. <clears throat> she stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. Now, how does that relate to a good man? Proverbs 31 man. Well, he'll be charitable and not mind when his wife feels led to give to the poor. Okay, again, his heart safely trusts in her. I heard a story the one time where uh, a man that I know, I'm not going to mention any names, but his wife sent $1,200 into Pat Robertson. And he's flipping out, you know, how dare you send that kind of money in and stuff? You know, we don't have that kind of money. You know, that's a, that's a problem. That's not a Proverbs 31 woman or a Proverbs 31 man. Don't send in, you know, huge checks to, to some multi-millionaire cell evangelist. That's a problem. That's not what this verse is talking about. Okay, that's giving your money to the wrong cause. But if a woman sees somebody that's poor and her husband safely trusts in her, she can say, here, here's some money, you know, here's some food, here's something to wear, whatever. And her husband doesn't have to, she doesn't have to report to her husband and, and he has to, you know, what did you do? What did you give? Why? Because his heart safely trusts in her. Okay, that takes effort on the part of the man. First of all, to provide the money so that she can give it to the poor, but secondly, to trust her. Trust her judgment. Alright? <clears throat> Look at uh, verses 21 and 22. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. And there's another little interesting thing there because the Proverbs 31 woman is mimicked by Mystery Babylon, Revelation chapter 17. Her collars are scarlet and purple. I thought that was kind of interesting how Satan counterfeits 
what God says is right. You know, and of course, Mystery Babylon is a type of, of uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, you can read about its destruction in Revelation chapter 18. But it says there about that this woman, again, she's providing clothing. She's making things. Okay? And what's that require of the man? Well, to provide for her and encourage her in what she's making. Tell her she's doing a good job. Now look at verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Her husband is a good worker. Okay? Keep your hand there and go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Doesn't mean that the husband has to be a wealthy millionaire and, and a know it all or something like that, and that's why he's known in the gates. No. A, a good man that works hard and that's it's a good, fair businessman, he'll be known in the gates. He'll be well known among the people. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. That's what we're going to read here. It says here, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, uh, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Now, now let me just stop here for just a, a minute. Um, this is in reference to somebody who works. You say, well, it's a servant there. Well, we'll see about that in just a second. But the fact is, when you work as a man... It shouldn't be with eye, eye service as a man pleaser. In other words, you don't just show off when everybody's looking, and then when nobody's looking, you go back and take a nap in the break room or something. No, it doesn't work that way. You should say, this job that I have is from the Lord. It isn't that I got this because of my talents or my skill. It's from the Lord, and I'm going to do my very best as unto the Lord. Okay? Why? So that you'll be known in the gates. So the people will say about you, that guy, you know, I don't agree with his religious beliefs and stuff, and I don't like him witnessing, but he, he is a good worker. I'll give him that. That's the testimony that you should have as a Christian man. And you say, but I thought it was about servants. Let's continue reading. Verse 8. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So this verse, these verses here about working not with thy service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, those refer to both bond and free. Now you say, does the Bible teach slavery? Yes. It does. It's right there. In the New Testament, in the Pauline epistles, for a Christian in the church age. It's right there. You can listen to the sermon about, you know, does the Bible teach slavery if you want more information on that. Okay? But the point is, this not only applies to a bond servant, but also to a free servant. Somebody who's just employed. Okay, You should be known in the gates if you are a Christian man. You should be known as a good worker. Now turn back to Proverbs chapter 31. <clears throat> We're going to look at verses 24 and 25. It says here, She maketh fine linen, and selleth it, and delivereth girls unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. You know, one of the best things is for a man to encourage his wife to the point where she's actually able to go beyond just making simple little projects to now she can even make something that could be sold. Okay? Now, is that a good thing for the woman or for the man? Both. It's encouraging for the woman that she's able to be so professional now because her husband provided the materials for her and he provided the encouragement for her. That's good. It, it helps her. But it also helps the man because now his wife is able to make things that are so nice that people want to buy them. So it helps him out. Brings more money into the household. But how is that going to be possible if, as a man, you put down your efforts of your wife? It's not going to be possible. And, you know, we have a lot of women here in this area, you know, the Mennonite women especially, you'll go to these little Mennonite farm stands, and they got all kinds of stuff for sale. Sale, You know, they have little baked goods and little, you know, hot pads or something that they crocheted or knitted or whatever, you know. They, they do all kinds of stuff like that. 
you know, we were up visiting some friends up in northern Pennsylvania, and they had this little country store run by Mennonites, and they had a whole section of stuff that the women sewed. You know, and that's good. What's going on there? Well, she make it fine linen and sell it. That's a good thing. Now, would that be possible if her husband didn't provide the funding to buy those materials? No. Would it be possible if she had a husband that was always putting her down and saying, you can't sew anything, your stuff is hideous, and blah, blah, blah. No. It takes an effort on the part of the man, first to provide the money for the material, but second to provide encouragement to get her to the point where she feels confident enough to sell the items. So, as I keep saying, there is a Proverbs 31 woman, but she's only possible if there's a Proverbs 31 man. Look at verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Where did the wife get her wisdom? What did we read earlier? It comes from the man. If she's to learn anything, it's to come, she's to ask her husband at home. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's right there. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32 says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Did you know that a husband is compared to Jesus Christ? There is no physical Jesus Christ here on this earth in the sense of he's over in Jerusalem or something. Not yet, anyhow. He will be in the Millennial Kingdom. So who is Christ's representative on the earth? The church. But more specifically, specifically so within the church, the structure of the church, it's the man. The man is to be like Christ for his wife. That's what the Bible says. Now let me ask you a question. Does Jesus teach his bride? Yeah. The Lord Jesus will be there to teach you. A man must also teach his wife. That's an important thing. The wisdom that she has when she opens her mouth with wisdom and her tongue is in her tongue is the law of kindness. That should come from her husband. Again, the, her tongue is the law of kindness. She's not going to have a very kind tongue if her husband doesn't have a very kind tongue. He has to be nice to her and, and speak the right things to her and, and be a good, strong Christian leader. Now look at verse 27. This is another good one. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. What did we just read about idleness earlier? Yeah. A good man, a wise man, will keep his wife busy and encourage her to the point where she wants to willingly work with her hands. You say, well, that sounds like a lot of work. Yes, it is. I don't know if I want to do that. Okay, stay single. It's just that simple, you know. Look at uh, verse 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Did you know a good man will call his wife blessed? He'll say, boy, I sure am blessed of the Lord. The Lord blessed me by giving you to be my wife. Again, we go back to the thing of encouragement. And it takes effort. Okay? Sometimes you, your wife does things that you think are dumb or whatever or you don't agree with and you want to blast her and it's like, just shut your mouth. She does things differently. You know, that's something that I've had a hard time with because I'm used to dealing with men. You know, and you can't deal with men the way you deal with, or can't deal with women the way you deal with men. You know, when we're out doing firewood or when we're out, you know, on the gun range or whatever, you know, you can make fun of men, put them down and stuff like that. They get hurt, you know, you say... Get up, sissy, you know, and stuff like that. You can't do that with women. <laughs> you know? You have to you have to kind of understand, get to understand women, and you have to encourage them. Okay? And that's how you get a Proverbs 31 woman. Not by just forcing these verses on her and saying, you submit to that. I'm going to do my own thing, but you submit to these verses. You know? No, it takes effort on both parts. Um, look at verse 29. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Now, how, what does that tie into? Many daughters have done virtuously. What do we start out with? Verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. 
Okay? You have to search for a woman who is virtuous. If you are a single man, don't complain to the Lord if you didn't wait on the Lord and go out and get the wrong kind of woman, which we're going to see here in just a second. Don't go out and complain to the Lord and say, well, you know, what is this woman that you gave me and stuff, you know. Well, you need to wait on the Lord. Wait for the right woman. That's not going to happen very, very quickly. Okay, there's a lot of times it's going to take a while. Look at verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Okay? Don't let your flesh choose your wife. Let the Lord choose your wife. Now, I look back at my past and I say, there was a couple times when it was my flesh that was trying to choose a wife. And some of the women that I was interested in, it wasn't the Lord. And fortunately, I had enough, you know, the Lord had grace for me enough to, to mess things up, you know. And I didn't end up with some of the women that I was interested in in the, in the past. Because it was my flesh. It wasn't the Spirit. It wasn't the Lord's timing or the Lord's will. But uh, it says there, A woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Well, by who? Who's the one that shall praise her? Look at verse 31. Give her of the fruit of her hands. Remember what I said. You provide those raw materials. The food for the recipes and the and the cloth to make clothing and, and whatever else. Give her of the work, or give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Okay? What did it say in verse 23? Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. The man goes and he sits down in the gates and he sits there and everybody goes, Boy, that's a nice shirt you have on. Where on earth did you get something like that? Oh, this thing? Oh yeah, my wife made that. Really? Wow. Boy, she must be telling that's that's a nice shirt. Oh, you know, you go sit down in the in the gates, you go to your work, you know, you go to your job and you say, Oh, hey everybody, here's some cookies my wife made. Everybody eats them and they go, Wow, those are really good. What's going on there? Her own works are, are being praised in the gates. She doesn't have to be there. She doesn't have to oh, we have to say something nice because she's standing here. No. Her works are praised in the gates. Why? Well, because her husband did his part. Her husband took care to provide those things and encouraged her to the point where she has some real talents now. And a lot of people do not do that. A lot of marriages don't do that. The husband doesn't encourage his wife and he doesn't provide for her. And what do you have? Well, you have a rotten marriage. You have a bad marriage. You know, the Bible says men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do you know self-love is, is the root cause of all sin? Okay. I mean, I know the love of money is the root of all evil. But I'm saying, what's the love of money derived from? Well, the love of self. You're thinking about yourself. You know, it all goes back to that. And when you have a selfish person within marriage, they're thinking about themselves. And you can't do that if you get married. I mean, think about, again, the spiritual analogy. Jesus Christ gave himself for the church. What if Jesus Christ was selfish? I mean, I'll be real frank with you. If I was the Lord, God of glory and heaven, would I want to come down to the earth and be born in a stable to poor parents, live for 30 years, working as a carpenter, and then go and get crucified for something I didn't even do? Um, probably not. I mean, it'd be kind of like, you know, the Queen of England or something like that going and, and working at McDonald's. You know, would she want to do that? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Well, who's more of a royal family? The Queen of England or the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of heaven, the God of the universe. And yet he humbled himself to come here and give his life for us. It's an amazing thing. Now, you don't have to do quite that level of sacrifice if you're a husband, <laughs> but there is still some sacrifice there. One more place to turn to. 1 Peter chapter 3. Another good verse on the subject of marriage. This is a tough one. <clears throat> and this is something that, you know, I'm learning more and more. And uh, 
I think every man has to learn it. And if he wants to have the right kind of a wife, this is what he needs to do. First Peter chapter three verse seven it says here, likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. You have to provide for them, but you also have to be smart enough to realize when your wife needs to talk, when she needs to just be left alone, when she needs to be encouraged. When you you got to learn all that stuff. Okay, knowledge does not come in two seconds. Knowledge is something that you gain over a lifetime. You're to dwell with your wife according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Women are more sensitive than men. Okay? It's the way it is. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You say, well, I've heard the message here, Brian, but I'm not convinced. I'm just going to do things my way because you don't understand how rotten a wife I have and whatever. I'm just going to do things my way. Okay, your prayers are going to be hindered. So why won't God answer my prayers? Well, you better check your relationship with your wife. Are you doing your part? Or are you just saying she's supposed to be a Proverbs 31 woman and she's not, so therefore I'm going to be rotten to her? Tit for tat, you know. Is that what you're doing? You better not. You better do your part. You better be a Proverbs 31 man and provide for her and encourage her when she does something right. Okay? It's an important thing. Where would we be as Christians if the Lord Jesus Christ didn't do that for us as His church? Things would be kind of rough. So that's going to be it for this morning. We're going to close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank You, Lord, um, for the promises of Your Word. So much wisdom in there, Lord. It just is staggering sometimes to, to see all the things that are just so true. And to see how the world goes against the standards of Your Word. They tell women today that they should be career women. They should be feminists. They should not let a man tell them what to do. And yet... It's a, a man's responsibility to, and a man, you know, men are taught that they should just use their women as, as just fleshly toys, basically, and just push them around and, and do everything for them, and buy them the best of this and buy them the best of that, and so that, you know, they'll have a happy marriage, and that's not the way it works. Convenience is something that there is a danger with. Uh, and I just pray, Lord, that those women out there that listen to this, that they would be challenged to do more things with their hands, especially as times grow worse. People are going to have to learn how to prepare food and to even make clothing and, and work with their hands like that. And I pray, Lord, for the men out there that they would be challenged by this sermon as I was when I was preparing it and that they would learn to encourage their wives and support them in what they're doing and, and build them up to the point where they can feel confident enough to even to make things that can be sold um, to help with income. And Lord, I, I just pray too that if there are any couples out there that the husband has lost his job as a result of outsourcing or downsizing or all the other horrible things that are happening in this country, I pray that the wife would be patient with her husband. Uh, I know it's it can be very rough on a marriage for the husband not to be able to have a job and not be able to find work. And I know that that's happening, Lord, to thousands and thousands of men across this country. And it's a real strain on the marriage. So I pray, Lord, that the wife would understand that and uh, appreciate her husband and, and see that he is trying and things. And, and uh, But I pray, Lord, that, that we would, those that would listen to the sermon would submit themselves to the Word and, and seek to um, obey it. And I just uh, ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.